Hi, Karen. Welcome to the NT Podcast. Hi, how are you? Yeah, glad to have you here. Can you quickly introduce yourself to our audience, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Karen. I'm a former Googler with experience launching hardware, software, apps, and IoT products in over 43 different languages. And I'm currently a contractor um, supporting global scalability for the WhatsApp Business API. Wow, WhatsApp Business API. And uh, that's a very interesting topic here. Um, yeah. What are you guys doing in relate to the conversational AI space inside of WhatsApp? Um, well, WhatsApp Business API is mostly a um, conversational platform and we partner with our global partners um, to essentially allow businesses to deploy and activate um, conversational API um, through various spot ad automation as well as a human or handover protocol um, to live um, call centers where there are messaging agents. And uh, can you maybe um, share a recent AI project you guys have been working on so people can understand a concrete example? Um, unfortunately, um, due to confidentiality, I can't really go into um, a lot of the current projects we're working on, um, but I can talk about another personal project um, that I recently launched Absolutely. as it relates to um, AI. Um, there's a website I recently launched called biasinai.com, and it's a g evolving global directory of companies, startups, academia, and NGOs, essentially creating products, data sets, research and services with a lens on how some organizations are helping the commercial marketplace navigate different types of bias in AI products, um, be it racial, cultural, algorithmic biases. Um, one of our industry categories includes COVID-19 applications, um, which is essentially really quickly impacting the, the AI space right now. Wow, uh, speaking about COVID-19, uh... How do you see the, the virus impacting the industry overall? Yeah, so I do think there's an innovation explosion on how, how AI is contributing to fight um, essentially the first worldwide global health crisis. Yeah. Um, I think the most obvious applications that a lot of people know are either symptom checkers or contact tracing applications um, through you know, uh, using conversational AI through various messaging applications um, worldwide. However, um, there is a lot of other um, healthcare applications. Um, like for example, one is, um, for example, uh, called the Butterfly Network. It essentially uses AI and an iPhone to take thermal imaging of lung ultrasounds in areas where hospitals may not have medical equipment and allow um, medical professionals to communicate to one another um, based on that body of thermal imaging um, data. Um, there's like other applications such as Rokid, which creates AI fever detecting glasses for security guards to wear to scan symptomatic individuals and in crowds. Um, there's drones, which use AI for contact list delivery of medical and food. Um, delivery both in China and Japan. Um, there's even companies that are essentially using AI and conversational NLP to enhance patient experiences and e ER department flows to reduce waiting times. So, well, so many different uh, use cases with AI now with the, the whole uh, situation. Which yeah. is one of your favorite, like the one that excites you most? <laughs> Um, I do think there's a lot of possibility in kind of the internet of things. Um, I think a, a lot of um, people have just been really cooped up and have cabin fever globally, and there's a huge appetite to resume, resume normalcy in society. Um, so I do think there's um, a lot of hope and a lot of kind of emerging products which will help with um, not only contact tracing, but allow people to safely um, essentially be in more crowd or uh, high population volume centers as well. So to reduce risk. Yeah, uh, and I think many, uh, especially tech uh, businesses in, in, in the US, they're even like uh, trying to think about in the post uh, COVID-19 area, like, uh, allowing employees even to remain working remotely, uh, like permanently. 
And this is kind of changing the whole landscape of how the work relationship works, right? Yeah, I, I do think there's a whole nother aspect of, of AI that will come in um, in terms of the remote work workforce industry, um, uh -huh. how that will really scale and evolve as well. So I, I think a lot of offices are realizing that, you know, they don't necessarily need large skyscrapers and, and, and paying rent in order for productivity and for managing large um, employee staffs, so. And one of the recent uh, feature, maybe it's not so related to WhatsApp business, but to WhatsApp itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the recent, uh, I think, news come out is like WhatsApp is introducing very Zoom-like video uh, conferencing features for like uh, multiple people having video conference uh, experiences. So how do you see like these kind of changes that they are introducing in WhatsApp? Um, that is probably um, more of kind of a peer-to-peer -peer or to use for family and, and, and friends. Um, that's where the, the root of the product um, had its origins. Um, and so, you know, as, as COVID creates a sense of either isolation or, or distance, um, I think a lot of companies such as WhatsApp are looking at ways to create that sense of uh, social connection and um, intimacy and, and belonging to kind of bridge uh, some of the, the realities that, that humanity is facing right now. Interesting. What, what are some of the main challenges you uh, see as uh, the conversation on AI uh, in, uh, is facing uh, for the next step? Um, I, I, I do think that, um, I think um, Gartner predicted that about 85% of AI projects will deliver erroneous outcomes due to bias in either data, algorithms, or the teams responsible for managing them. And I do think COVID is putting in certain economic competitive pressures to force companies to rely on AI to automate decision making. Um, that humans used to do. And I think that presents a lot of moral, legal, and um, social consequences that will result. Um, I can give like a few examples how this might play out across industries, uh, namely healthcare. Um, I do okay. think, um, the, the, you know, conversational um, AI with the rise of public surveillance initiatives happening globally. There's collection biometrics and location data and, you know, uh, feedback from the public um, on how infections are progressing is really biased to the technical savvy um, who have smartphones and data plans globally. Um, and for instance, somebody's like 75 year old grandmother who doesn't really know how to use a phone for anything other than to talk to someone else, um, okay. you know, might not be included in, in some of those data sets, although that population is the highest um, risk group. Um, I do think, um, you know, a, a lot of times um, there's IoT voice assistants as well that are engaging in conversation. Um, there's Siri and Alexa. A lot of them are trained to give responses based on huge databases of recorded speech that essentially is dominated by you know, white upper class Americans. So sometimes it might be challenging for the technology to understand commands and conversational nuance input, whether that be emotional um, or very complex for people outside of that demographic. Um, so I definitely think um, there definitely needs to be um, some more di diversity in AI data sets um, that are, are training um, a lot of these um, a AI applications. Yeah, I think one of the uh, issues is precisely as human uh, are so diverse uh -huh. and people are trying to build this like uh, one solution that fit for all problems, uh, like the general AI, which is kind of a, uh, um, a very biased solution itself, right? If the solution is fitting for every cases, then I think uh, it, it kind of lack the, the diversity that it needs to, to have this real type of uh, conversational experiences. Yeah, yeah, definitely the more data and the more inputs, especially over a long time horizon, can, can yeah. only help um, provide just more inputs for various different scenarios and, and audiences. And maybe the last question here, and I need, to, I need you to think very carefully about saying it, is sure. can you mention uh, a controversial uh, opinion you have about the future of chatbots? Yeah. Um, 
So <laughs> um, I tend to agree with a lot of AI scientists, such as okay. like Hawking and Musk, who kind of portend the end of the human race with AI. Okay. And there's definitely sci-fi visions of how this kind of Machiavellian machine run amok world um, can so kind of play out, um, whether, you know, it's Westworld or Terminator, or Skynet or or Battlestar Galactica. I think humans have very good intentions um, when going into things. Mm. And I do think it's really easy to blame technology, um, but I think it's really okay. us. I think we have to realize that machines really mimic and receive inputs from, from humans. And, you know, we're kind of the, the, the flawed evil ones. So we just have to think very carefully um, how we're uh, approaching um, the, this new technology because I think it's a, it's a, it's a fine fine balance. So, <laughs> so uh, can I say like uh, you are trying to to say like if the AI ends up the 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 human race, it's our fault because we haven't designed it properly. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I do think there needs to be either more guardrails or we need to be um, you know thinking more about um, consequences. I, I think a lot of it is humans don't really know what they want. <laughs> they have kind of this kind of approximation. Yeah. Um, and so a, a lot of, you know, a AI systems might deliver outcomes that we might have not predicted uh, because we haven't put those exclusions, you know, in there or, or, th or thought of them. So, um, yeah. Well, I think for those cases, the, the project you personally working on, the bias in oh. AI, is kind of uh, putting things in place to help people realize there, there are a set of things that is not right. So we have to uh, fix that before we rely more on AI to maybe predict yeah. the future, right? Exactly. A way to either, either audit, diagnostically audit, or put in checks and balances to make sure the AI um, experiences, whether it be conversational AI or other applications, are, you know, fair. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's and a very good way to wrap up our anti-podcast because we have <laughs> reached our time limit. <laughs> um, maybe we should save some time for future topics and future episodes. I, I think you have so much interesting things to share here, but as our anti-podcast need to fix with the, the time that people has, then uh, I'm sorry, I have to, to stop here. It's okay. But Thanks so much for time. the time. Stay healthy and safe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye.